Um, so, so yeah, hi, hi everybody. Um, I, uh, I uh, want to welcome you to the Arts Council's uh, second In Conversation. Um, I'm Maria Evans, Artistic Director for the Arts Council, and tonight I'd like to introduce our host, Tim Andrews, and our featured artist, Lenny Pocket Moranti. Uh, Tim is a former Arts Council board president and currently sits on our advisory board. He's a major supporter of our Anne Reeves Artist in Resident program and makes that work possible. Tim has a large art collection and has always supported the work of local artists and crafters and we are so fortunate to have him as a member of our community. Lainey is an accomplished artist who I have had the pleasure of knowing for many years. Uh, I first met her when she, was, she had um, introduced her work back when the Arts Council was located at the Princeton Shopping Center and her, she had a show in our contemporary gallery. She has been a vendor in our annual holiday art sale, Sauce for the Goose, and a participant in the, our, our Community Arts Fest and many other street art fairs, which has resulted in building a tri-state client base. Lainey has an exhibition coming up uh, in our Taplin Gallery scheduled for March 2021, uh, which we are excited about. And in the summer of 2021, her work will be featured at the Axelrod Performing Arts Center in Deal, New Jersey. Of course, she's got a website, a local studio, and also sells her work through Facebook and other social media venues. I want to thank everybody again for attending tonight, and um, I want to turn it over to Tim, enjoy the conversation, and Tim will see any questions that you may want to ask in the chat thread. Tim? Great. Thank you so much, Maria. I really appreciate your introduction, and it's my pleasure to to join tonight, but also to, to be as supportive as so many other people are in the community of the Arts Council of Princeton. Um, so let's get right into this conversation. I'm super excited about having a talk with you tonight. Uh, it's been good to get to know you a bit, but tonight I sort of want to open it up a little bit. And for the audience, we've got a couple of things going on. Uh, first of all, um, let's not forget that the Arts Council of Princeton is sponsoring this tonight. Um, and so we really appreciate any donations or contributions. You know, this is a very tough time for all nonprofits, so certainly be generous. And also, um, Lainey has is, is graciously uh, told us that anything that she sells over the course of the next few days, as a result of this, um, she'll be tracking, and uh, we'll tell you more about that later, but uh, anything she sells, and she'll, she'll do a contribution back to the Arts Council, so we really appreciate that. So with that, let's get started. I, I know you're sitting in your gallery, but before we get to the gallery and, and start doing a little exploration, um, I, I sort of wanted to just sort of get to know you a little bit and let, let others here who... Maybe some of them have known you, it sounds like, for a long time, but others are maybe new to your work and to you. So let's sort of just rewind the tape. Um, you know, sort of where did you grow up? And tell us about sort of early childhood. <laughs> oh, hi, Tim. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm really delighted to have been approached for this. I think we're all uh, eager for ways to connect uh, through this uh, isolation period. And although the work I do is by nature very isolating uh, and, and private in nature, I always, always, always welcome opportunities to speak to uh, the wider public about my work and to invite you into my studio. It's part of my MO and I thank you for the opportunity to do this at this time. Um, <clears throat> so um, my childhood, I was born in Canada. My dad's a Canadian. And um, I have uh, three sisters uh, who were born during the time my mother was with my dad in Canada. We were out in the wilds north of North Bay, uh, a forestry, forestry community. And my dad was a forester uh, telling people how to, uh, he was a first graduating class uh, of uh, what we now understand as um, uh, forestry management, sustainable forestry. Anyway, we, we weren't there for long, and I was actually raised in Maryland by my mother and her mother, who was an educator um, of a private school uh, outside of Baltimore, and we spent many years living with her uh, at the school and also out in the country, um, mm -hmm. under the trees, barefoot, bare-chested, you know, scooping up uh, dead turtles and having uh, 
having the wild and the outside as our playground. And, and I think that was a very important part. And also that my grandmother was an educator. Uh, we were surrounded by um, all kinds of art uh, in the home and uh, at the school, ancient art. And we were, uh, a visual stimulation was part of our, uh, our being raised by her. Um, my teenager years were in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, we all were very, very luckily relocated to that area. And, um, and my very first art lessons were by uh, an edgy, the well-known educator still and, and very good artist, Walter Bartman, who, uh, who got me and a bunch of other people over his course of 30 years of teaching for the secondary school system in Montgomery County, Maryland, but also still continues to teach. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> that was, that's in a nutshell, my early years. And so, uh, what brought me here to New Jersey was by way of California. I left uh, high school at 18 and moved with, uh, my mom's sister was a ceramicist and in California, and she taught me the ins and outs of production ceramic work and also introduced me to the concept of the street fair as a way mm -hmm. to sell artwork. And although I had seen that as a child, she and my mother both as artists had sold their work at, on the proverbial iron fence um, in, in Philadelphia and Maryland. Um, it was as a young adult that I got to understand it better and uh, then stayed in California for a couple more years with another set of relatives who took me under their wing while I went to community college uh, out there. And that's where I learned about foundry work and, uh, is, and started to get uh, a taste for doing sculpture. And so when I learned about the Johnson Atelier here in New Jersey. So let me, let me jump in, let me jump in. Yeah. Don't, okay, I got, I got a thousand questions we haven't gotten to yet. <laughs> so, so let's take it slow. We got, we got an hour, okay? okay? So let's sort of rewind the tape just a little bit further back. So, sure. so when as a child do you remember thinking, hey, I like this art thing? I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was eight years old. I was doing a drawing of a microscope uh, that was in the classroom and it had been an assignment uh, for, for something. I still have the drawing. Oh. And I had a sketchbook and uh, I still have those sketchbooks. And so I was always drawing things. And uh, so yeah, eight years old. So you're eight. And, and did you know that art was a thing? You said you sort of grew up with it. So did you, I think you said your grandmother was an artist. What other art was in your home at that early age? You know, what, what was that engagement? My mother, my mother is an artist and um, my grandmother was an educator. And uh, I, I knew that art making was a thing. I, I knew at eight that that was a career. Hmm. Uh, my mom wasn't making a living doing that, but subsequently she did. She was working at a, a, a cultural arts magazine in Maryland and at one point during our teenage years. And uh, she was an illustrator. She did um, thousands and thousands of illustrations for that magazine mm -hmm. over the years. And yeah, I, I never had a question about whether or not that would be uh, a vocation. I, I knew at eight I was gonna be an artist one day. That's so interesting to me because, you know, there's so many people today that that don't know what they want to do and to have, you know, that realization at this age of eight and, you know, is, is now, so were you on the East Coast when you were going to these, well, I guess you said you were going to Philly and, and your and your grandmother or your, or your mother were selling art. So then you moved, and how old were you when you moved to California then? I was 18. Okay. And, and like I said, I was very lucky. I had relatives who took me under their wings and uh, because I wasn't going to college, I really didn't. Um, have uh, financial means or, or a real direction. And also I hadn't been a very good high school student. Uh, I, did, I did all the art and, and just slid by on everything else. <laughs> and so you mentioned that in California, you sort of dis discovered foundry work. First of all, you know, not everyone probably listen, we got 50 people now on, you know, probably not everyone knows what that means. And it's sort of a specialized world. You know, many people may have had some experience with sketching in high school or or all sorts of things they might have done in high school from an art class perspective, but foundry work. So, so one, what is that? What's the definition of that, I guess? And then secondly, so, uh, what did you sort of jump in and start doing? And, and how, did that, how did you sort of engage in that? Because that's really a different thing than, than doing sure. sketches of a microscope, right, when you're eight years old. Right, so 
Um, I'll back up with you, Tim, um, and say that in, in high school, I did a lot of painting. I, I had a part-time job and I was buying my own paints and I was working in oils and had uh, a really good foundation in traditional approaches to still life and landscape and portrait work. And I, I had a good facility with all of that. Um, but by the time I got to community college in California, I wasn't doing, I, I was a little disenchanted with all of it and went into more of an exploratory mo mode. And so when I took a sculpture class, just as part of the curriculum, um, I then, I liked it and saw that they had a sculpture foundry class. So that's where you're making, in this case, we were making objects out of wax and taking it through the ceramic shell method for a cast bronze result. And mm -hmm. I didn't make anything mind blowing, but I got a taste for the process. And as a task oriented person, you know, I, I like a pile of dirt to shovel. <laughs> uh, I, like, uh, I like the processes involved in the noise and the, and the fire and everyone's got a job and it's teamwork and all that. I, it really appealed to me on many levels aside from the art part of it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because you, you discussed, you know, art uh, early on, you said, and we'll maybe get back to this later, but, but you talked about it being a solitary thing. But what you described that got you really interested in this was the teamwork and sort of all the, the sort of drama of it. So that's interesting yeah. to me that, that, that that's a contrast a bit, right? A little bit, yeah. Well, uh, certainly. Um, but, but it was that that uh, I think drew me then to the Johnson Atelier here, which was a, an enlarged version of what I experienced. I've always been a very private person. Mm -hmm. So working in this sort of team environment was new to me. Um, aside from having had a job uh, as a teenager in a small team environment, um, this other thing was just far more stimulating. And, you know, the so the sculpture I started to make here in New Jersey, and I was 21 years old. Okay, so you um, came here from California, you're about 21 years old. You heard about the Johnson Atelier, and how did you hear about that? And how did you sort of land a spot? I mean, you know, you, you didn't have any, you know, college, you know, art education. I sort did. Of, how did that, or you did, okay, from the community by college. Then, class, by right? then I had two years and was on the Dean's list. And so I, <laughs> my self-esteem was a little boosted. Um, <laughs> But I, I learned about it because I wanted to continue my education, but again, I didn't have much money, or I actually had no money. But um, I, I knew about form letters, and so I wrote a form letter that I sent out to, it, it had to have been 100 schools. It was something like that. And uh, it was essentially an introduction to who I was and, um, and said that I wanted to continue school and, and asked for help. And, mm -hmm. Two schools responded to me, and one of them was Lycoming College in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And although I wouldn't have batted an eye at them, they had this affiliation with the Johnson Atelier, which mm. was how I learned about it. And so uh, my junior year as a Lycoming student was to spend 16 months here at the Johnson Atelier. Mm. Um, I ended up not going to Lycoming after all. <laughs> But ever you never went there at all. You never went I there never, at all. No, I never set foot on the place. And, <laughs> uh, but that's okay. By the time I was done 16 months at the Johnson Atelier, making a bunch of artwork, I, I made a lot of work that I understand now as being a, a sculptural representation of landscape painting. So mm -hmm. uh, the painting never left me. I was just exploring things about um, space in another way. Uh, still with a two-dimensional mindset. I honestly didn't know that at the time. <laughs> it took some maturity and wisdom to get there. And so um, was, that, was that all, was that ceramic? Was that bronze? What, what was the work at, at Johnson? Bronze work. It okay. was bronze work at the Johnson Atelier. I yeah. think there was an aluminum piece and a copper piece in there, um, but it was mostly bronze. Um, and, and you were there for about a year and a half, it sounds like. And so what, what happened after that? What's the process? After been? that, I, I uh, moved back with my mom and kind yeah. of uh, licked some wounds a bit. <laughs> it, <laughs> it had been a very intense time. We, we worked very hard, everybody did. Um, 
from, I, I think the day started at 7.30 in the morning and ended at five. And uh, we were making uh, artwork for other people, learning mm -hmm. the processes, and then we would grab something to eat and then come right back to work uh, until 11 o'clock at night on our own artwork. And so our days were long and, and very physically demanding. And we got a lot done. I don't know anybody that was a slacker during that time uh, that I worked with. And, uh, but I, a year and a half was enough for me. And I went home and uh, I needed to reset uh, my direction. Mm -hmm. And during that, uh, I think it was nine months that I was in Maryland. And uh, during that time, I was doing some, I got a job doing landscaping work. And uh, so I got healthy again, got outside, was breathing fresh air instead of foundry fumes. And uh, also hooked up with, um, I, I got back in touch with Walter Bartman, uh, my old high school art teacher, and uh, also with the Maryland State Arts Council, which, uh, uh, for which I got a grant to be a artist in residence at my alma mater. Mm. And that was really terrific. Yeah. We ended up, um, and I was only five or so years older than the high school students, the seniors there. But uh, it was a great opportunity. And I had been working on a great big piece in wood and wax at the time. And so I hauled it over there and they had set up a big old uh, army tent and I started to work on it. And in the end, some of the parents who'd been involved with the art program, and it was a very intensive art program at that high school, um, they raised money to have the piece cast at the atelier. Oh. So I came back to the atelier as a client, which was really terrific. That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. And what happened to the piece? Is it still at the high school? It's still there. It's, it's uh, on Walt Women High School uh, auditorium wall on the outside for everybody to see in oh. Bethesda. Yeah. What a great honor. Yeah, it absolutely is. Uh, I was a, a bit of a mouse in high school, so it's kind of cool to <laughs> have a big roar there on the wall. <laughs> Yeah. So, so how are, how have things progressed since then? So sort of take us through the next, oh. you know, whatever, whatever the couple of decades are between then and then, then we're going to jump into some of your work and in take a, a tour. The, so know. in a nutshell, um, in a nutshell, one of the guys I met at the Johnson Atelier wouldn't leave me alone when I moved to Maryland. And that was Fred Moranti. And uh, he and I were great pals and we had spent some time together and uh, just socially and then also in building a furnace and we, we really hit it off in, in just on a friend level. And uh, that turned into a romance over the nine months that I was away. So I moved back to New Jersey and um, I'll, I'll fast forward through the mid eighties. I ended up uh, again, working as a landscaper at a nursery for a while, just being outside, which I really wanted. I, you know, I just needed to be healthier for a while. Um, I ended up going back to school at 26 years old, Mason Gross. Uh, actually, I, I took a class or two with uh, Mel Leipzig and also with Jimmy Calavita to get my AA, which I hadn't completed. And then I launched into Mason Gross School of the Arts, where I had the great, great fortune to work with Judy Brodsky oh. and, and uh, Bob Cook. So and, awesome. Uh, Judy is so awesome. Wonderful educators. And... Um, they really just left me alone to do what I was doing and to explore. The, I didn't get a sense of real um, uh, molding from them. Uh, I, maybe because I was already a somewhat more mature artist. I don't know. But uh, I got a degree in painting, although my thesis had no painting in it whatsoever. <laughs> it was a combination of ceramics and drawing. And uh, I had said was it didn't matter what my material was. Um, making a mark on paper or canvas was essentially the same thing it you know it was uh moving color around and making forms so so you must have been doing some painting you know you must have been doing was I, it I were, were you doing landscapes or what were you doing uh in in college i was doing in the end i was doing these very abstract uh forms in fact i think you have some of those forms in that list of images that you and right. i looked at together um, I was doing ceramic vessels at the time, and I was exploring uh, landscape themes in a more uh, uh, abstract way, a, a more reductive way. And let's jump to actually one of a couple of these photos. So, I, I for the audience here, I, I went through um, uh, Lainey's uh, Facebook and, and website and picked 
15 or 16 images that I sort of want to talk about. And she and I have not discussed them at all. So I simply put them together and, and we sent a, a, we shared a Word document back and forth. I sort of said, this is the order in general. And I don't want to talk about it beforehand. So I want it to be all fresh. So Maria Evans is going to help us out here. So Maria, if you can come back in and if you can sort of display um, that document, that would be awesome. And we're going to go to the first image. Uh, and right now we can't see, oh, uh, there we go. Perfect. That's 1984. It's about 14 inches tall. It's a, a cast bronze uh, piece that I did at the Johnson Atelier. Okay. I did about six different ones. And you can see the two-dimensional influence. That's like a frame around it. Yeah, it's um, amazing. I really fell in love with this when I saw it. Uh, the back is really interesting. I actually have that in my studio. Maybe we'll have time to show it to you in oh. 3D. Yeah, I would love to see that. Uh, and let's scroll down. Is this, it, what's this, tell us about this piece. That's the one at the high school. Um, that's about oh, great. feet across, about three and a half or four feet tall. And so I had taken window, wooden windows, uh, antiques that my grandmother had stored under a barn. And uh, I integrated sheets of wax. And so at the time, again, I didn't know really what I was doing as working intuitively. And for me now, I really see that as a painter's brush stroke. Uh, across those windows. It's a landscape in a window. Um, That's actually a bronze, is that right? It's bronze, yes. Okay. Uh, this is uh, a one of the series of drawings I was doing when I was at Rutgers, um, when I was doing vessels at the same time as these drawings. And so, you know, the, and, and I was integrating botanical imagery. So things like the bleeding heart, I mm -hmm. think that's what it's called. Yeah. The, the perennial flower, Dicentra. So this is a pastel or is this a pencil? Do you remember what yeah. this is? It's, a, it's a masonite panel that's been gessoed and then there's pencil and pastel. Hmm. Great, let's go to the next one. This is one of the vessels um, that I did around that time. This is in a private collection in New Jersey. Uh, that's Raku pottery. So I, oh. the layers, and uh, I want to refer to this piece later when we're looking at my current paintings because this idea of layers and shallows and borders around water, it all, it's all beginning, it's all going to relate back to this work. Hmm. Okay. Let's look at one more piece and then we're going to go back to our conversation. So this, I think, was an early, an early landscape piece, right? Uh, so this is 2012 when I picked up a brush to do a landscape painting after almost 30 years. So, so let's not skip over those 30 years quite so fast. So you started working outdoors, you were doing some landscape work, et cetera. And then were you doing art all the time you were doing that? And then sort of how did you re-engage? So no, I, uh, after Rutgers, um, I, so we're talking about 89, 91, I finished my degree. I worked for a couple of years in Princeton at an art gallery, learned a lot mm -hmm. uh, doing that. And then I decided that I really wanted to start a family with Fred. And, uh, you know, we decided that together. And so I had a daughter and then uh, three years later, and I decided to be a stay-at-home mom. I continued to make art, continued to sell. Um, and then uh, we decided to go for another child and I ended up getting pregnant with twins. Wow. <laughs> so also girls? Um, also girls or boys or what's your boys. Uh, okay. That was my lightning bolt uh, <laughs> down a little bit. Um, and really, Tim, I decided I made a conscious decision to put my art making aside because I really, yeah. I couldn't do it all. I just as much as I would have liked to, I, I needed one pile of dirt to shovel. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's the one that I, I focused on. And I had a blast raising my kids. I really did. I got involved with the schools. I did mural projects that I'm proud of. Um, Mercerville Elementary School actually won an award based on a, pro a program I started and did uh, for them. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's when raising kids when uh, 2012, they're all the youngest, the boys are uh, young teenagers and we had been camping every single year all those years. I decided at that point and having raised them as Boy Scouts and my daughter is a Girl Scout, I didn't need to be managing everything on the campsite anymore. And so I picked up a 
set of paints on just as a, an afterthought and mm. ended up just making paintings. I hardly did anything else. <laughs> wow. So after, it's amazing that you can sort of walk away from it, but then, you know, the enthusiasm of raising children and the importance of that to you just really trumped your whole, what, what you'd spent all your life doing really up to that point. It's an amazing uh, thing. I, well, I, I have to say, I have found ways to make, to still be having my hand on a brush. And so Maria referred to a show that I had at the Arts Council back when it was in the strip mall. And yeah. um, so that show was a result of my being at Communiversity with, with the projects I was making while I was raising kids. And what I had done was because I wanted to get my hands creative, working creatively again. I was do, doing, uh, for friends and family, I was painting wood. I was painting little picture frames and furniture and things like that, just for fun. Yeah. And uh, ended up making sales to friends and family. And I took it to university one year, made some money and ended up doing that for about three or four years. Put my kids through preschool with that money. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, somebody who i don't remember her name now she was involved with the arts council she saw me at the university and asked if i'd be interested in doing a show there so i basically took some of this uh it's really nothing to do with the rest of my art it was a complete aside this this sort of animal imagery that i was doing and i think it was the result of doing the mural work in the schools i just sort of uh found my hands doing this other kind of imagery and it didn't really tax me uh, intellectually. It was just fun and I went with it. Um, mm. And that, that first show was a long, long time ago at, with the Arts Council. But mm. you know, I don't discount it because Tim, although it was a very different work and I don't talk about it until right now with you in regards to the rest of my work, really just the act of putting down a brush stroke and not mm. messing with it in this sort of decorative painting project I did. It taught me quite a bit. Uh, I, was, I was considering color very differently. And uh, I was putting down, I was deciding on putting down and living with a brush stroke, which wasn't something I'd ever done before. And so I, I tell people the story because I want to encourage them to not discount all, you know, the kinds of projects they might want to discount because it doesn't seem highbrow or something. Anyway, uh, yes, it was 2012 when I picked up a brush again and I hadn't, it wasn't that I hadn't been holding a brush all that time. It's, this is when I returned to what I wanted to make very mm -hmm. deliberately. Now I'm gonna make what I wanna make. And so you're camping with your kids. Um, and this may be one of the first things that you create after you decide to pick up a paintbrush. And so, and so maybe Maria, if we can put that back up. And so, so you've, you know, what, what brought you to landscapes, you think? I mean, it's sort of interesting. I mean, well, you spend this time, you know, working as a landscape artist or, you know, or not an artist, but as a landscaper or working outdoors. I'm, 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 I'm intrigued also by the fact that you grew up, at least your very early years, um, you know, in Canada, and your dad was a forestry guy. So he was sort of out, I presume, you know, out in, 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 in land, you know, in, in sort of some of the scenes you painted. So how did you come to, to the landscape, you think? Uh, uh, you know, I don't know, except that it was what I was drawn to. It, mm -hmm. I, even those bronzes were landscapes. I, I don't remember uh, a point where I said I am a landscape painter. I don't remember that, but I do remember, and I talk about it in a blog that I did for a while. I remember thinking, I want to start painting again. And because I don't know, I, I can't pick up the brush, so to speak, uh, where I left off, which was actually in the early nineties, I was doing some very conceptual paintings, very, uh, and I don't think you have those in your set. Uh, yeah, I so. They were. I'll show them to you here in the studio. They're very conceptual, very abstract, and I just I couldn't pick up the thread, Tim. You know, I just wasn't there. I wasn't the same person, and so I thought I want to paint again. I'll go to something that I I feel comfortable with. Just going to go back to the beginning, 
and pick up the thread and see where, uh, pick up that thread just of the familiar rather than the art thing that I was doing before, which was very intellectual. And I just, it was a road I didn't feel like I wanted to go down anymore. Mm -hmm. Does that and make sense? It does. And we're showing a couple of things. And if we can just pause here, Maria, and not advance. So we sort of went through a couple of things. What, what do you want us to, I mean, you, you were experimenting with color. You clearly, you know, you have, you, you have sort of this repeating nature of, of water. So, yeah. so, so tell us a bit about what you're thinking there and, and sort of how you think that sort of evolved over time. Okay, so uh, one of the things that I did very, uh, uh, I was very conscious about, I would say since the, since the late 80s, early 90s, was that um, I was really interested in, in concepts and ideas about privacy and mm. um, the public and the private. Um, and I don't see public versus private, but both. And I think that was a result of several things. One was that I, my, first, um, my first experience, my first uh, um, being aware of living in a home was that school, which you know is our home, but it was also a very public place. It was a house that had these wings attached to it. So the school and your was our home. And that's your grandmother's uh, home, grandmother. that was your grandmother home school in, right. in Maryland, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. So um, th this, this issue of public and private and, um, and solitude and using water and vessels as a uh, metaphor for some of these issues, you know, uh, I think that you know one could speak speak to all kinds of conditions uh, globally across gender and economic status and all that. That people are are often um, their privacy is violated in emotional and physical ways, um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Certainly, I've experienced that in my life. Lots of people have. And my artwork has always spoken to that. So uh, looking back at my landscapes that I have done now, that first painting you showed when I was camping, by the way, that was New Hampshire. And who isn't going to do a painting of the landscape when they're in New Hampshire? <laughs> you know, it was an easy pick. Um, and But then from that, it was, I, I was working full time too, by the way, uh, during this time. So when I, I painted when it was weekends or mm -hmm. after work stealing just little teeny tiny paintings or just on the weekend and I'd tell the family don't don't come near me I've been <laughs> work all weekend and they were really brilliant about that and uh, that's awesome well, let's take a break from the from we're going to go back to the, some of the some of the uh, paintings and, and other pieces of art that I sort of plucked and put into this word document but let's let's shift now I think to your studio let's just sort of jump ahead to your studio a little bit I also want to remind people um, that if you send a chat with any questions, I'll try to take questions. Uh, it should be on the right side of your screen, but there may be a button that says chat or something like that. So it depends on what your setup is. So, so you want me to give you a tour? Yeah, you let's want me take to a tour. Around let's a take a tour. So, uh, but just certainly, you know, anybody wants to ask questions, sort of type them in there and, and we'll do our best to answer those. So, so, uh, so let's sort of, let's set the stage for just a second. So you now have a studio where, and... Uh, I'm and tell yeah. us about the studio a little bit before you give us the tour. So where are we? Right. Situate us. How big is it? How many days a week are you there? Sort of give us a little bit of the, 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 you know, the lay of the land a little bit. I, I'm going to back up for a second and say that during the time that I was working full time uh, in 2017, I uh, did not ask permission from my employer or my family. I just went ahead and applied for a residency, a two week residency mm -hmm. at the Lackawack Field Sanctuary in Pennsylvania. And I got it. <laughs> and so I left my job and I left my family for two weeks. Wow. And, and I really feel like that launched me forward. I made a bunch of paintings. I sold most of them, even just uh, from my blogging and my internet presence. And um, I decided to invest that money into pushing my career forward and getting more space. And I, I approached the grounds for sculpture. Uh, about this, uh, about getting a space. I knew one was empty. Um, and so I got the space. And so that was um, October 20, uh, December, December 2017, I think. 
is so three years ago. So I, I think one lesson for everybody that's on this call, you know, we've got 50 some people in here, is that we, we, many of us have the thing that we love doing and then we left it for whatever it was, a career decision, a love, a family, a geographic thing. And, and what you've shown us, and, and you're gonna be showing us in a minute, but, but what, what you reminded me of is the fact that it's never too late to sort of get to what you love. And the fact That's that really you went through decades, really, right? Yeah. Uh, of, yeah. of maybe you were doing some art with your children and maybe you were doing some things for the schools, but, but fast forward to 2017 and, you know, and here you are taking it really seriously again and sort of dedicating a full-time activity. Right. That is unbelievable. Right. I mean, honestly, that's a great lesson for all of us, I think, to, to remember right. that, you know, that love is so important. I've got a lot of support to do it. In fact, uh, so much support. I, I had made a lot of sales in 2017. I sold just about every painting I did in 2017 and uh, 2018. And um, I, I, I saved all that money. And then I quit my job a year and a half ago. And, wow. uh, and that was a, one of the scariest things I've ever done. Um, it, it, definitely scary, but so far so good. I've met um, with the help of collectors still buying my work. I'm meeting my very, very, uh, my lowest expectations for income, which is great. I consider that a win. That's beating um, is good. So, so, so now we're in this gallery. So how big is the gallery and how many days a week or how often are you there? So um, it's, I, it looks like a gallery. I'm glad you're calling it that. It's actually my studio. Oh and yeah. So <laughs> I don't always have so much artwork on the wall. I'm showing you some of the recent work, uh, which I'm calling Shallows. Uh, which I started last fall. That's uh, four of them up there. Um, there's a really big one here. This is uh, five foot square. Um, you get a little closer. Get a little closer to that. We want to take a little closer look at them. Let's see. And so, what's the subject of this? What's the? So um, I was looking at the uh, at shallow water on a forest floor. Hmm. And so, what you're seeing is um, what's in the water, um, where a shadow falls on the water, you're gonna see what's under the water surface. And then also the reflections of the sky and the trees around it. And so I'm mashing it all together, um, which is something that I've done all along. Um, this sort of, uh, um, this pressing of space and visual experience into one. Your work looks so 3D. So much of your work appears yeah. so 3D, you know, and I, you know, from the early work to now. So that seems from a, a non-artist perspective, that seems so difficult to do. It must take a, I mean, there's a lot of planning. Like what's the process of being able to create that layered look from your art? I mean, it, it, it looks, it's so fascinating from, again, from a non-artist non perspective. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure how I do it. I just, I'm doing, I'm happier and happier over time. Here's a big piece. That's uh, four feet square. Um, I'm pretty happy with that one. Um, some paintings are faster than others. I'm going to show you, Tim, this is, I don't know how the light is. Can you see that? Yeah. Is that the piece that I picked the photo of? Watch what happens. Yeah. Well, watch what happens in the back. Oh my God. I love see? it. I'd actually, in a way, that's taking the canvas, right? Yeah. And just ripping it back. And so, although I didn't know it at the time, really, I was exploring space and this concept of layers uh, even then. Um, it's just that now I'm, I'm working with uh, color uh, mm -hmm. and uh, reflections in another way. I wanted to tell you that uh, not all the work I do is in the studio. I do quite a bit of plein air work as well. This mm -hmm. is the I did in Lawrenceville at Turtleback Park. The one directly behind your head? Yeah. I love that. Can you get a little closer to that too? Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah, that's awesome. Really beautiful. So uh, I do that. I do plein air work. This is a piece I did at, uh, let's see, the, in the Abbott uh, Marshland, mm -hmm. uh, Roebling Park in Trenton, mm -hmm. a big old sycamore. So I do some plein air work as well. And then, um, and then I come to the studio and uh, based on what I'm doing out in the world and also the photography that I do, um, I, I play with all of it 
redirect all of it into these other compositions. This is a plein air piece I did in Canada. I go up to Canada quite a bit now, above mm -hmm. Maine. Um, that's three foot square. And so you can see the little tiny um, body of water up there. Very top, right? The top, the very top of the work. Yeah. The, that's Jurassic period rock. I can't remember now what the what you call that, but it's these little tide pools that have interested me. So um, tell us a little bit more about your. You mentioned photography for the first time just a couple minutes yeah. ago. So so do you take photos of scenes and then come back in your in your studio and recreate them, or do you do only yeah. plein air? Like sort of how does the photography work with your with with your other you know activities? Um, actually, it's um, it's just another way of seeing things. Um, uh, no, I don't do paintings of the photos. I know some people do, but I do reference them for, for some of the line work. And then, you know, if you were to, for instance, take a look at the, a photo that I referenced and then the painting, you wouldn't necessarily see, uh, I see. where the two come together or yeah. why they, why the two, what the relationship is. But, um, it's, I use them sort of as reminders, mm -hmm. balances, for the balances between things. But generally what I'll do is I'll reform um, the compositional elements mm -hmm. and invent the color. I was gonna because say, so, so is the color, in, I was gonna ask that question actually. So, so is the color the color you see or is the color the color you imagine? The color, I'm gonna set you back up on my, um, my little stand that I fashioned here with clamps. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the color is invented in order to convey an idea. Um, I think that we, we remember space and we remember light differently than we see it. And so um, the way I paint it is the way I experience it, uh, the way I want to, the way I want to experience it in remembering it. Does that mm. make sense? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's very interesting. So you're, it's how you want to remember it, not how you saw it, or yeah. it sounds, or or not even how it should be. Whatever should means. It's the way you right. want to remember it. It's it's um, and it's not even that. It's more about a, um, a, a kind of an energy mm -hmm. or and an atmosphere. Sort of the emotion, um, the sort of the emotion yeah, exactly. that you're with, right? It's a sense of place. Yeah. Not a portrait of place. Yeah. Let's go back, Maria, to the photos that I or the the uh, pieces that I selected uh, from the from the work on uh, on the Facebook. And I've been asked by somebody, are you represented by a gallery? If someone wants to collect your work, where should they start? And again, I'm I'm really moved by the fact you're going to be so generous to the Arts Council for anything you sell. As a result of this, so so, uh, and we'll do this at the end too. But why don't you, while we're pulling up some more of these photos, tell us, you know, how do how do people, you know, find what's available for for sale if they're interested in collecting some of your work? And sort of, are you represented by a gallery? And sort of, what's that about? I'm I'm working on that. So, um, Morpeth Contemporary in Hopewell has a few of my paintings. Um, yeah. I haven't had like a quote unquote show with them yet, but they do have a, a selection of my works. Mm -hmm. And they're really wonderful to work with because they know that um, I have a big presence here and I've got my followers here and uh, they know I work very hard to market my work. So if I have somebody who's interested in a piece, um, they're not stepping in my way for my selling it directly. These are all pieces that have sold. These are in homes in Princeton. This lower piece is in a home in Princeton Junction. The upper one is in Boston. So I'm very interested in the one at the, the, the one at the top. I was very interested in the um, angle. So if you're sort of yeah. below looking up, I think. Yes. So, so what was, what, what was the uh, original sort of version of this, I guess, and sort of like your eye, what was your eye seeing and sort of where, where were you? Do you recall what that looks like? Because I was very intrigued by the, by the, by the viewpoint here. I, yeah, I was at the grounds for sculptures here and uh, looking at the lotus ponds, which I return to quite often. That that painting particularly was a little bit of a departure from what I typically do, uh, but I had an awful lot of fun with it. I was sitting at the lotus pond and uh, doing drawings and uh, would just happen to have been there long enough for the light to shift 
uh, where I was sitting and I found myself looking, literally looking up and under these, um, these uh, fronds, these greens. Mm. So this, this photo on my monitor anyway is, uh, the color is off from the original, but um, compositionally it it's experiencing uh, the world from up and under the way a frog might rather than down hmm. on the way we typically would come upon this lotus pond. So sort of like a, a different view of that layering. You're still, yeah. you're, you're now down with the frog and not, not, you know, creating the frog. You're looking up from the frog's viewpoint. Right, right. And then the, the one on the one below it? Um, that's, that's the Abbott Marshlands. It's, I, the, the choice of color to me is very interesting. So do you remember what time of year this was? Or again, was this the way you want to remember? I mean, it's very red and very, well, you know. It, for, for some reason, uh, it's actually coming up, at least on my phone, the way I'm seeing it. The, this is, the color is off from the way it really is. It's not as brilliant or saturated uh, okay. as it's showing here. Um, it, it's, it's more muted oranges um, than this. But uh, it was a fall scene where most of the leaves had fallen. And, and again, you know, it's not that the trees are looking red and blue, but, um, and, and I'm not even, I don't even consider myself a colorist, but uh, when I was doing the painting, it just seemed like that was the appropriate way to talk about this expanse of marshland. And, and uh, it was kind of a lonely looking spot. Yeah, let's go to the um, next. Somebody Where named Barbara is asking what medium do I work in? I'm working with acrylic. I'm a very impatient person. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the, uh, the layering, the quick layering, um, that's a little plein air piece right there. The quick layering and the, the, the spontaneity that acrylic allows me it, it suits my personality and the approach. This little painting is, uh, it, I think about 14 inches long. Mm -hmm. uh, I still have that one. I did that sitting out on the at the treehouse at the grounds for sculpture, as a, a study for a much larger painting that I have here. Let's go down to the next one, Maria. That's I a love drawing. This drawing. I love this little drawing. That's uh, that's in a private collection in Moorestown. So was that a precursor to a painting? Yeah, I do studies. Yeah, I do studies. Uh, drawing is something that I picked up. I never did a lot of drawing um, until a couple of years ago, and now I work a lot with a Faber-Castell pen and a Copic marker, and mm -hmm. I, I like to keep it simple, and, and I call it cross-training. I talk to my students a lot about cross-training. I was never an athlete, but all three of my kids were, so, <laughs> I, you know, the, the slowing down of, of my hand and uh, the more studied approach to a thing to convey a more realistic uh, interpretation. Sometimes, and for me anyway, all the time, it allows my abstraction to have um, a stronger footing. Mm. You know, well, if I am structure, doing, a little bit more structure in that abstract view. Sure. Well, I can take liberties with a thing that I understand. And, hmm. and doing these drawings helps me to understand it better. Interesting. Let's scroll down to the next one, Maria. I um, love this. So this is probably an unusual selection. I don't know, but uh, I love this. So tell us about this, this Van Gogh Cafe. Yeah. So that's at the Grounds for Sculpture. Anyone local who's been there knows this little Van Gogh Cafe. And uh, when I quit my job, I would start my days by going there and having a cup of coffee and writing in my... Um, my journal, what, what it is that I expected of myself that day. And, uh, and also I would just warm up. Every day I would warm up by drawing. And so uh, that's Billy D, who's a local photographer uh, who also works at the cafe. That's him there uh, with the cap on. And oh, he's in, the, he's in there with, oh, I see. Yeah, of course. <laughs> the two I, like, I like the swirl in the upper left-hand corner. That's what caught yeah. my eye. Yeah. You know, I, I like to draw and, and uh, it's all just part of, when I travel, I draw quite a bit. My husband and I went to New Zealand last September as part of our 30th wedding anniversary gift to ourselves. And um, I, I took only drawing tools and uh, the people we were traveling with, longtime friends, they and Fred were 
were absolute angels to allow me to sit for 20 minutes or 40 minutes to do a drawing now and then. <laughs> you know, I'm being asked again, we didn't complete the question. I didn't complete the, um, the question and the answer in terms of if people want to acquire some of your work, should they uh, uh, check on oh. your website or sort of where should they look? Because we're very interested yeah. in having them do that because the, you're going to be so generous to the Arts Council. So I want to make sure you get a plug in for this. Right. So. So yeah, you can go to my website. It's not great, but it works. Um, it's a way to see what work is available and the pricing for it. And uh, that's the retail pricing. That's the price that it'll be, whether it's a gallery selling it or me. Yeah. And uh, so for the Arts Council, um, somebody will be paying full price and then 30% of that will go to the Arts Council. I have oh, no that's problem with that awesome. whatsoever. I think I'd, I'd be really happy to do that with you. But people can contact me through my website. There's a contact me form. And uh, outside of pandemic restrictions, I generally have, uh, I'm allowed to have people come here to the grounds for sculpture to my studio. And uh, that's by appointment only. And uh, like I mentioned, Ruth Morpeth has a few of my pieces. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's how you can buy my work. You know, just reach out to me. I'm on Instagram, uh, at Laney Makes Paintings. Um, I, I uh, have a nice little following there. Not great, but nice. And um, yeah, and on Facebook, you can see all my older work as well. You, I welcome anyone to find me on Facebook and take a look through my albums, which are all public. Great. So, you know, you, we've talked about, and we've got a couple more uh, pieces to look at, uh, but, but I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about, you know, it, it's sometimes for artists, it's hard to market themselves and sort of get out there. And you mentioned a couple of times in our conversation tonight, that it's a solitary work and, and yeah. these different things. So, so from an artist's business perspective, you know, three years ago or something, you just said, okay, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to do this full time and I'm going to, you know, do things. So, so how is it shifting to that marketing role and sort of how much time do you spend creating art versus trying to market yourself? And then of course, there's all these different venues that are out there now that didn't exist for most of us five years ago, like Instagram and all these other things. So, so how do you approach that? Because I think that for many artists is a really tough thing. Like how do you, how do you get a following and how do you, you know, make money? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm making it. <laughs> I'm making it up as I go, but so far it's working out. I, I try to be authentic, number one, Tim. I, I uh -huh. don't try to, um, you know, tell a story that's not true. So the truth is that uh, I try to sell any way I can. And that means shouting, you know, putting yourself on the top of the hill and waving your arms around. And, you know, that's, that's how I've understood it. I never went to business school. I don't know any other way. Um, and so, you know, going to street fairs, like, uh, it cost me money, but I went all the way up to Montauk last fall, last fall September. It cost me $850, you know, to get in the car, go out there, be there and come back. Uh, it's yeah. a huge investment, a huge risk, but that's what business, that's what you have to do in business. You have to spend a dollar to make a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I sold um, several mm -hmm. pieces and um, I, I, I didn't get rich off of it, but I wasn't in a hole at the end either. And I was able to pay some bills. And, mm -hmm. so, um, and, and so I look at these street fair opportunities as a way to advertise and you know meet new people and often showing up to like i went to montclair uh last uh fall as well i'd never had a presence in montclair and so a lot of people came across me said wow what are you doing here you know i, I was new as a vendor and mm -hmm. rose squared productions uh, put on this uh this series of street fairs for artists and artisans and uh but I, I remember I didn't actually, I sold, I think, two very small paintings, but I also sold drawings that I was doing right there of the park <laughs> that we were in. And people were so excited to just, you know, see me doing the drawing and then walk away with it. And um, I believe in building these connections with people so that it's the second year when sales actually happen. People, oh, I've been thinking about you ever since I saw you last year. And several of several times that happened at Community University, uh, mm -hmm. where people came back and uh, you know bought, some, were able to buy maybe not the piece that had initially caught their eye, but they purchased from me because now they were coming back, they were familiar, they were glad to see me again. So 
how do I sell? I just, I stand on top of the hill and I wave my arms. <laughs> that's, I think that's great advice for, I'm sure we have a lot of artists, you know, on the call who are wondering sort of how do I get my word out? And I, you know, I think everything you said is, is great advice for people. Let's pop back and read to a couple of additional um, sure. uh, pieces that I wanted to sort of touch on. Um, and again, remember there's, um, uh, uh, there's, uh, I can, we can take additional questions. Um, someone asked about your blog. So how do people find your blog? Can they find it oh, if they, if they that's, check? That's not current. That's old stuff. You're welcome to find it. <laughs> but, okay. and, and it's all relevant. It's all my backstory. Um, it's called Boxwood Beetle, uh, B-E-A-D-L-E -E, on Blogspot. Okay, can you repeat that one more time for people? It's the Boxwood Beetle, B-E-A-D-L-E. Okay, on great. the blog spot. And someone else just asked, did you spend much time at the Baltimore Museum of Art growing up as I did, as well as other art galleries and museums? No, no. Really? Um, I, and we lived in Baltimore when I was young, I, too young to be independent. And I, we moved to uh, Washington, D.C. area. It was Bethesda when I was 13 or 14. So the museums I went to, by the time I could be independent, moving around the world that was uh the national gallery of art it was the phillips collection the mm. you know the walters gallery all the washington dc galleries are the ones that i went to yeah and and um so let's look at this next if you back up maria just one back up right here so this That's piece is very intriguing to me so so was this a i mean i'm picturing you know i'm picturing what i'm picturing so i hope i'm i'm halfway right but i won't i'm not going to burst out and say what i'm thinking so so tell us about this piece. I really love this piece. This is the one of the drawings I did in New Zealand. Uh, it's uh, Punakaiki, uh, which uh, translate loosely to pancake rocks. It's on yep. the west coast of the South Island and uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, these, these huge, they're monumental rock forms. And so those are huge crashing waves down at the toes. Mm -hmm. And we're on a trail overlooking them and uh, it was sunset and although the rocks are primarily gray and this again this photo everything's showing up much redder than it really is yeah. um, actually I, I can go get my um, the actual drawing is here I can show it to you and maybe get a better sense of it but well, again that... it's all it's also on Facebook in my drawings album okay. um, yeah, this this drawing took me about 40 minutes it's Faber Castell and Coppock Beautiful, really a beautiful piece. Let's go to the, to the next one. I think we've got one or two more pieces that I wanted to cover. So this is much more ab sort of abstract, sort of, you know, is this more recent or is this an older piece? I wasn't quite sure. Actually, there's, uh, there were two, that's the black and white. I sometimes they desaturate my paintings when I'm showing people my work. Um, that painting is right behind me. Can you see me, this painting I'm pointing to? Uh, it's a little far away, but we've also got, I think we have a second one. That, so if we go to the next one, yeah. I, I actually selected there both of them. I selected both of them, yeah. Right. So what I do is I, it's part of my practice. Sometimes when I'm doing a complex painting, I'll desaturate um, a photo of it as I go, just to uh, keep track of um, the values within it compositionally. Um, uh, and so what, this is my most recent painting. And what I'm doing is I'm pulling my gaze up off of the ground in those shallow waters. And I'm looking at vines again. It's something that I started to do a couple of years ago. And I've been doing a lot of drawings of vines. Um, mm -hmm. Can people see what I'm showing them right now, Tim? Yeah. OK. Uh, get a little closer. Get a little closer. OK. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. Okay, go, so yeah, these, tilt it up just a little bit, but we can see that. Yeah. These are the drawings I'm doing of vines. This is kudzu vine over water mm -hmm. and uh, other sort of saplings and vines. Get a little closer if you can. And then go to over the left. Just a little closer. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So um, I'm, I've been interested in vines for a while, and uh, these are just some drawings that I've been doing of, of saplings and vines and water. You know, can you hold that spot one, just one second? We're going to do this again. So Maria, can you pop out of the piece of art you're showing? And then I think we'll be able to see um, those pieces fuller size. So that's, that's much better, I think, for people. 
Yeah. There you go. You can and see that? You, yeah, that's much better. If you go to the left as well and show the ones that we already sort of went past, I think they're now fuller size, so. Yeah. So these, these are the things I do on site. I'm, I'm plein air. I'm sitting there with my little bag of markers, just looking at um, the landscape and thinking about um, what I want to do in painting. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, and Marie, uh, if we can pop back down, I pop back to these last two. Again, I want to sort of talk about a bit more about those before we wrap uh, this this is my stack of drawings <laughs> so can you see this uh yeah we'll we'll, we'll pop back to that just real quick okay. Then. okay okay can you stay right stay right there and Mary, if we pop back out of that okay you can show this those yeah so uh uh there we go. That, this is, I pulled over the side of the road. I was drawing clouds. <laughs> it was a stormy day. So do you always have, you always have your pens with you and your paper? Pretty much. Yeah. These are some of the other drawings from uh, New Zealand. Um, I was just there last year and it's such a picturesque, beautiful place. It's oh, really, yeah. Oh, yeah, how about that? really amazing. Yeah. yeah really amazing. I'm, I don't see it. Um, anyway. Yeah, there's there's another one that was done at Pancake Rocks. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. And so, do you yeah. you know you mentioned photography earlier on in the conversation? Do you still do any photography as well, or is that? Uh... Um, it's just part of my studio practice, Tim. I, it's not that I show my photos, uh -huh. um, although it occurs to me that I could because they're getting better. <laughs> As photos are getting more interesting, but one can see them on Instagram. I post them on Instagram quite a bit. Okay. Um, Let's pop back, Maria, to the, to the, to the um, word document. I just want to look at these two final ones just real quickly again, because I'd like to sort of better understand the process. So we go back to the sort of the first one of these. We have two. So we go back. So this is, this is created how, and then we get to color how. So I just want to understand the process that we're seeing here. So Tim, the, go back to the color. That is the painting. It was never a black and white. Oh, I it's, see. I'll take, I'll take photos of my work as I'm working. Um, I see. Because, and I tell this to my students too. I say, sometimes you can get lost in a painting. And um, a part of my practice is to take progress photos so that if, I'm, if I get lost and I, I, I can look back into the sort of journal of its evolution, mm -hmm. I can sometimes find my way again and especially with these paintings that tend to be uh, somewhat um, I hope you can't see that is that is tend to be more complex mm -hmm. uh, desaturating it just a tool on my camera right you can take the color yeah. away uh, and now you can look to this black and white you can see because color is really seductive Tim <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, and so this will bring you back to sort of the bones or the skeleton um, of of a composition. Is is it is the balance working? You know, without all that seductive color, is it working? And mm -hmm. that's why I'll sort of have these conversations with myself, but then I'll also show them to my public because I I, I that's what I like to do. I say oh, th these are the kinds of things I'm thinking about when I'm making my work. I love that. You know, I've never really thought about that before, but you're, you're right. You get so seducted or seduced by the, by the blue or the green or the reds or whatever it is. Yeah. And then, and then the, the black and white just shows what it is. And, yeah. you know, you know I've, I've collected, you know, as, as Maria said in the beginning, I, I collect a lot of art. I'm now going to start when I take photos or look at images before I actually acquire something, I'm going to start doing the, a black and white photo and a full color photo and sort of see how I feel about the bones that you were talking about. I think that's really, uh, I've never really, thought about that before, but that's really a great lesson for me and, and probably for the artists on the call as well. Yeah, it's a tool. The camera is a tool and I embrace it. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, well, I, I don't, I, I was never, um, let me, let me rephrase that. I, I don't want to try to figure it out any other way when I have a tool that does it so easily. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got one, uh, another question we haven't gotten to yet. Are there any particular colors you gravitate to in your work? Um, you know, I, 
I was painting for a few years. I was working with an exceedingly limited palette. I was working with, uh, and I, I use golden acrylics for, for those of you who are listening, who care. Okay. <laughs> um, and so for a very long time, until about six months ago, I was working with Payne's gray, a titanium white, Indian yellow, and uh, alizarin crimson. That was it. Just mm. those four colors. And one of them's white. And so I got all kinds of, you know, close enough to a blue that I was satisfied out of that Payne's gray. And it also became my black. Mm. And I could make a green out of the Payne's gray and the Indian yellow. Um, what's happened in the last, I'd say, starting with uh, when I went to France in uh, 2019, uh, I went for residency for two weeks in France. And that was the first time I'd ever spent two, two weeks without worrying about anything other than just making paintings. That was brilliant. But I also at that time and more recently have picked up some cadmiums and that has changed the direction of my work. I also had a very short term uh, dalliance with Hansa Yellow that I put an end to. <laughs> Why did you put an end to it? You decided well, it too much? <laughs> Uh, I, I would I would suspect if you went back into my portfolio, you could pick out exactly when that happened. <laughs> <laughs> so so as we wrap up here, this has been an awesome conversation. Um, so what haven't you done? You know, you you I, I marvel at your ability to sort of be in the art and then choose not to be in the art in the same way you are now while you're raising your family and now you're back in the art. And you've done photography and, and you did some pastels early on and you're doing drawings and you're doing all these. so so in terms of the tools and as we think about you know the progress of of technology and and other kinds of tools that that an artist can use what do you think what haven't you done yet that you want to try doing is there anything that you haven't done yet that you want to really try yes I want to do some printmaking again. I've done a little bit of it and I have a small press um, that I've had for 30 years <laughs> and haven't used a very small press. And I do want to, uh, I've done a little bit of printmaking before, um, mm -hmm. but I want to play with it a little bit. Um, I'm not ready yet. I, I've got it sort of rolling around in my head what I want to do. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't expect it's going to be sort of a traditional approach, but I'm not sure yet. Um, Are there and I want to do sculpture again. Uh, I was going to ask about, so, so from printmaking, have you done any printmaking? Did you, you know, there's so many great printmaking folks in the sort of Princeton area, some with us now and some not with us now. Right. So, right. so have you worked with, if you worked with any locals about that? No, I haven't investigated. You're the first to know. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. I love to break news. This is great. I love to break news. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and I want to start making some sculpture again, although I'm not sure yet. Again, I'm not sure yet what that is. Uh, again, just sort of, uh, these are the things that I'm dreaming about right now, literally dreaming about, you know, sometimes a painting will occur to me in my dreams and uh, then either I remember it or I don't, but um, I want to make sculpture again. I think that there's still more that I want to say and do sculpturally. And I think I'm going to pick up, in this case, I'll pick up on a thread um, for, for economic reasons, as well as ease mm -hmm. of use. I'll pick up again with the, uh, the hammered copper, and I'll show you. I'm going to walk over to outside you, my studio. While you're walking to that, we've got another question. Curious about your beautiful first name. How is it picked, named after someone, et cetera? Here. There's a piece I did that's five different pieces of hammered copper, roofing copper. Oh, how beautiful. Can you get a little closer um, that to that? And can you get a little closer to that? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to get the, an angle. Can you see that now? Yeah, and is the, frame of the, is, the, is the frame of the window, is that wood and this is on it? Or is yeah. the frame something it's else? A, yeah, it's a salvaged piece of wood. So, um, you know, I may pick up again on that, uh, that approach. Uh, I'm not sure. You know, I, it's my five-year plan. <laughs> okay, well, we all need a five-year plan. So back to this question from the audience. Curious about your first name. How is it picked, named after someone, et cetera? My first name? Your first name, yes. Someone's very I was interested given in my first name. <laughs> but I, but I, um, so Laney, it's pronounced Laney, and it's got an mm -hmm. accent on the E. It's what I grew up with. 
Um, and uh, although my first, my legal name is Helene, H-E-L-E-N-E. -E -E, and it was a nickname that just stuck. And um, I think my grandmother was, I know my grandmother was a Helene and her mother was Helene. And in the German tradition, which they were, they were German, um, it, the little child was Helene Kin, uh, and then Laney, sort of like Thomas, Tommy, and Tom. Yeah. 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 But uh, I was never anything other than Laney. Great. Well, this has been an awesome, you know, a little over an hour together. Um, I've gotten a lot of na nice feedback from people who have asked questions and have been saying things. So, um, you know, the one, the one quick uh, last question here. Um, you're such a natural and gifted painter. I'm wondering if painting sometimes provide inspiration for more detailed versions in graphite or whatever. I'm sorry, I, I missed some of that, Tim. Okay, sorry. Um, do you ever make drawings after the paintings? You're such a natural and gifted painter. I'm wondering if paintings sometimes provide inspiration for more detailed versions in graphite or other forms. Oh, interesting question. No, it's always the other way around. <laughs> Uh, the painting is the final thing, and uh, what's what's somewhat new is um, doing the series where I really investigated a an idea. You know, these shallows that I'm wrapping up now, where mm -hmm. I really it's not a one off. Um, it, it's I think it's the first time in the last five years where I said, okay, here's a theme. I'd like to explore this theme. Other than the couple of times I've gone up to Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and most recently I went up, actually, I went up early February, uh, to make paintings and to teach a workshop at an art center, um, in St. Andrews and on NPR, as I drove, drove up there, they were talking about COVID in Italy. Um, no. so, um, I, I did a series of ice paintings up there and we hardly ever get any ice down here. Um, and so. Uh, you know, I'll do these these thematic things. Like when I was in France, I did these themes of the the coppice trees. But to your to the question, the drawings always come first. It's where I understand a thing. I I, I sort of have my intellectual experience with it, and then when I paint, I'm zoning out. I'm just painting. Mm -hmm. It's purely a gut reaction at that point. I make some decisions. There's a little bit of uh, you know working with the camera as a tool and all of that, but it's it's usually uh, I'll step up with my paint and st stagger backwards six or eight hours later. <laughs> so a couple more quick questions before we wrap up. Do you make your own uh, stretchers? Yes, I do. Okay. I love working with wood, and uh, and my my wood working tools are some of my favorite things. Um, so yes, I do make my own stretchers. That's awesome. Well, this has been such a great conversation, Lainey. I, I really have appreciated, you know, everything you've shared with us tonight on this on this call and this video. Um, I want to remind folks that this is sponsored by the Arts Council of Princeton. Uh, we really need your help. Uh, please go to the Arts Council of Princeton's website and generously donate. Um, you know, the the arts, uh, including the Arts Council, are all in in a tremendous uh, strain right now uh, from the COVID uh, nineteen and what it's done to the ability for organizations to raise money and to do fundraisers and to, to do events that get people together, which is really what the arts, you know, are often about. And so uh, please be generous. And then, um, as we mentioned, uh, Lainey has been so generous to say that if you reach out, you know, on her Facebook or on her Instagram or on her website and find a piece that you would like to acquire, certainly reach out to her. She'll be charging retail price. And then uh, the Arts Council will be getting 30% of uh, the proceeds. So that is such a generous thing. Any, any last words you'd like to say before I reintroduce uh, Maria? Uh, but it's been just awesome. Thank you so much for this hour together. I really appreciate it. Oh, Tim, it's been really a pleasure. And, and thank you. you you're, you're easy to talk to. And, uh, and I, I really just appreciate the opportunity. I really do. And to uh, anybody who wants to reach out to me about work, uh, listen, we can all, we can look at a painting from six feet away and I can meet you at a Best Buy parking lot or, or something <laughs> similar. And I have no problem doing that. I, I think it would be a, a story that we can tell in the future. That's awesome. Maria, do you want to pop in and just uh, sign us off here? You bet. Thank you so much, you two, for a really interesting discussion. Um, 
I, I want to thank everyone for joining us and making us a part of their evening. I, um, I feel like I've learned so much in just an hour. Um, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Lainey, for bringing us into your studio. Um, that so your work just always keeps evolving. It's so exciting. Um, yeah, I'll just wrap up by saying, um, check us out next time. Um, Tim is a, uh, a great interviewer. And check out our website at artscouncilofprinceton.org and you'll see all of our upcoming events. You can support our spring fundraiser all together now. And we're also hosting a um, virtual dance party on May 23rd. The details will soon be available to register. And that's going to be um, big Memorial Day fun. So I'm just going to sign off. Great. I love these. This is our second one. But Thank I want to so much. Oh, what's she have? What's she have here? Oh, that's her. Is that your? Uh, oh, that's her uh, Instagram and her email. Website. Put it a little closer. Just a little closer. Yay. Just a little closer. Great. Okay. Yes, yeah, so everybody. Great. Support. Support us. Support Lainey. Stay safe, stay interested, and stay a member of the Arts Council. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining Bye. us. Bye. Bye. Take care. Goodbye.